good afternoon and welcome to the Bristol Jazz and Blues Festival podcast. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Johnny Bruce, who is a wonderful trumpet player and a very, very dear friend. Good afternoon, John. Hello, dear friend. Hi, Katia. Hello, fans of the Bristol Jazz and Blues Festival. Hope you all are well. Yeah, yes, indeed. So here we are in lockdown number three. Uh, as you see in the background, I've still got my, even though it's middle of January, still got my Christmas tree. Why not? Keep a little bit of joy going, Kat. You know? So, um, Johnny Bruce, um, you and I Hello. have known each other for uh, eight years? Eight years, I think. Mm -hmm. I've been in the Moscow Drug Club with you for eight years this year. It's pretty crazy. Or is that about seven years if you don't cancel 2020? I'm not sure. Exactly. So, Johnny, tell us about you. What? Uh, where should we start? Can we start at the beginning? It would be better to start maybe before the beginning of last year. Otherwise, it doesn't paint a particularly <laughs> interesting story. Um, so I am uh, a trumpet player from Essex originally, a little town called Saffron Walden. Uh, I started playing when I was 14, 15. Uh, and yeah, fell in love with it. Didn't really have many interests before then. Um, the moment I picked it up, apparently I went home and showed it to my dad and I borrowed it from school and, and told my dad, I'm a trumpet player now. And he said, well, can you get a noise out of it? And I could, and uh, I just kind of became obsessed with that. Um, and then, were yeah. Your parents, through... Were your parents musical? Um, my mum sang when she was young. My dad plays piano uh, and guitar, sort of at an amateur level. Um, but my dad was very um, supportive and encouraging and taught me lots of lots of musical things when I was growing up. So, And then I went to music college, went to the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Cardiff. <laughs> it was lovely, actually. It was about say, uh, four years there um, when I started on the classical course and kind of got my chops together um, and then switched over to the jazz course for the last year and a half. Um, and then, yeah, a few little roundabout twists and turns and... Now I'm in Bristol. I've been here for ten years now. So, so really what it. what made you switch from classical to studying jazz? Why why did that happen? Um, I always loved jazz music. It had been going in my ears since I was a little kid in the car. Um, when my dad used to always play the G. Kellington uh, G. Kellington sixtieth seventieth birthday concert um, with amazing trumpet section with Cootie Williams, who was the the plunderby expert. Uh, and Kat Anderson, the high note expert. And I remember my dad used to say, well, when I started playing trumpet, he said, do you remember that, the sounds that we heard in the car that you used to giggle at? Because we used to laugh at this screaming high trumpet and this wah, um, plunger thing. And he said, yeah, you, you know, you just started learning trumpet. Those, both those sounds were the trumpet. Um, so I w went back and sort of revisited that and, um, and realised, well, actually now high notes and plunger are a massive part of my, my style. So it had always been going in and I'd, I'd been improvising with friends uh, outside of sort of classical studies and just kind of felt that was the form of expression I wanted to have with music. Um, I really enjoy the classical thing as well, um, but it just felt that that was the world that I wanted to be in um, and I wanted to really experiment with sound and, and improvisation. So kind of naturally led that way. And then obviously Bristol is a natural transition on from that with its jazz scene. So yes, um, we are. and a very, and a very good one indeed. Uh, I think yeah. we're really lucky. Um, yeah. And I guess in some ways jazz suits your character more. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm quite an independent, um, outspoken uh, person. <laughs> So I don't think necessarily um, performing the music of others um, in an exacting way that classical music uh, demands um, is necessarily enough of a release of my expression. Um, so yeah, definitely. And, you know, obviously jazz is an umbrella term for so many different styles. And that's another big reason why I love being a jazz musician um, is the amount of different styles uh, particularly with the trumpet, the different ways in which you can play the trumpet. So it's really challenging across the, the sort of big spectrum of things from playing lead trumpet to bebop and early jazz. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a lot of versatility in there is what I like. And um, kind of my favourite, when people ask you what's your favourite style to play, um, what's your thing? My thing is 
enjoying doing all the things. Um, can say jack, jack of all, master of none. I don't know, but um, I, I really enjoyed sort of playing in the in all the different um, different eras. There's a hundred years of music there, so over. So yeah, but ex definitely. excellent discipline with the classical. Would you agree? Yeah. Very good, yeah, and, and particularly to provide um, sort of structure and order uh, as a young man, teenager, particularly for me, I think I really needed the sort of discipline of of uh, practicing and learning in that way. Um, and theory, and I suppose, and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and chops, you know, for a trumpet player, uh, it's, a, it's a horrible, nasty, evil instrument that doesn't like you very much. Mm. Uh, and to... Um, yeah, it's Hard, the hardest one to play. Is that is that right? Some people say. I mean, um, I don't know. People say the guitar is logical and the trumpet is really hard. But because I play trumpet, for me, the guitar seems complete. Seems like the hardest <laughs> instrument in the world. So um, <laughs> completely logical. It's trying to get your your chops together, um, and I think that formal, more disciplined route through the grades and and uh, into conservatoire level um, on the classical courses provides that kind of structure to mm. that stuff together. It's all transferable skills, you know. I mean, the instrument's the instrument, but um, yeah, I think it's important to, well, you shouldn't rule out any style of music when you're, when you're trying to develop your, your craft, you know. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, it's nice to have had that grounding, you know. Yeah, I, I went through the same thing and found this exactly the same thing. Right. Very, very glad for the discipline. Definitely, um, and also just not having some of the technical hangups if I'd spent those earlier years focusing on my improvisation, um, then I'd probably end up with a few more technical hang-ups than I, than I do have, um, maybe before this year. Um, but it means that when I've explored my improvisation, the execution of them technically hasn't, hasn't been too much of a challenge. So you know, I'm quite grateful for that, that way yeah. around. You know. So what um, first jazz gigs then, what, what happened? How did you get going? Were you out on the street with your demo? What happened? Yeah, well, um, so my first jazz gigs, I, I teamed up with a friend of mine um, from school. He's a guitarist uh, called Tom Corey. Um, and we started a band called Johnny B and the Blues Makers. Hey. We just got together after school, you know. Um, but I was quite an entrepreneurial. Well, I'm from Essex, you know. So I was half in the gigs, mate, you know. And um, Yeah, and so we actually had quite quite a few gigs. We used to go out and play weddings and parties and in the local pub on a Sunday. And, and um, we were just playing 12-bar blues, really. Um, but got got into improvising and, and sort of how that worked in a band setting as opposed to a um in an orchestra drill. Um and so yeah, started doing that and then um yeah, started kind of when I moved to Cardiff and started college, I started picking up the old bit bits of gigs here and there and um kind of snowballed from there. So you said you moved to Bristol. Was that right after you finished studying in Cardiff? No, I stayed on for a little while because I picked up quite a lot of work um while i was at college there was already some gigs lined up for me in south wales um then i moved down to dorset for a bit with my girlfriend at the time okay. and then moved to bristol 10 years ago because there was just wasn't a lot of work in south wales and i hadn't really made i knew ben waghorn already um saxophone player um and he suggested i came over so okay. I'm over. Here we are. did you end up playing with ben yeah, well, I already played with Ben in the Dave Stapleton Quintet, which was a band, um, yeah, Dave Stapleton, piano player, um, who runs the edition record label. Um, and he invited me to join his band in, while I was still at college, I think, 2005. Uh, and we toured Europe and, and went all over, and Ben was a saxophone player in that band. Uh, so that was a great end to playing all the um, international jazz festivals and um sort of seeing, getting my name out there as a, as a jazz musician and then work as sort of from there. Right, okay. So he, he was kind of the first, felt you know, older musician that took you under his wing a bit and... Very much so. I mean, Ben Wycombe was great. Um, he, he, he taught me a lot about, about improvising and things that, because um, I haven't really studied it for very long by the time I'd switched course at college. So yeah, playing with Ben, I learned a lot. Um, and he spread my name around and started picking up bits of work there. So. And so when you describe yourself, you sort of say pre, you're a pre-Miles Davis trumpet player. Um, yeah, um, no, they're, not, they're not my words, but I, um, 
Oh, it's a, I can't think who wrote the, that review. You call me, I'm a pre a pre Miles player. In other words, I'm hot, not cool. Right. And I don't know. I think I'm hot and cool. I think anyway. you are hot and cool. As Thanks, well. Kat. I Love you. I completely agree. But um, so, would you agree with that 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 sort of title? Um, maybe. <laughs> And why? I think, I think if you my do. playing changed a bit since since that uh, that was the perception of my playing. I think I've incorporated more um, Miles sort of modal stuff into my playing as my as my playing's developed. I think it's it's really obvious that I've got a love of the early jazz stylists, um, Louis Armstrong and uh, Roy Eldridge and Red Allen and uh, Cootie Williams and all these Harry guys. James. Uh, Harry James, you know, you know. Um, and so, yeah, definitely, I, I'm, I, I like using um, the big sound of the trumpet, um, which is probably more what they were getting at when they said that. You know, Miles's approach to the trumpet was uh, very different to anything that was happening up until that point, um, and there was a lot of um, a lot of fire in in the players, sort of Dizzy Gillespie and Roy Eldridge, and um, and yeah, and then obviously when we got into the into Miles Davis, it's kind of factioned off. We have got Freddie Hubbard going one way, who's sort of rinsing all over the horn, and then Miles, who's doing a very sort of understated, um, moody modal approach um which i've started getting into a lot more actually um but yeah i love the early early stylists and i think i'm, I'm sort of associated with that sort of big loud upper register big tone sort of style you know very melodic which is definitely, which yeah. is definitely where my heart is you know yeah great and so um you've you've been quite a feature uh with the jazz festival over the years um it would have been year nine i think in, nine. in 2020 um wow. so uh and i know because i've 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 seen all of the the concerts and uh been a huge part of the festival all the way through um you have had some amazing opportunities haven't you you've, oh, you've met and played with some of your heroes and unbelievable you, yeah can you tell us can you take us through a couple of of experiences that you've had over the years through the festival and 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 players that you've met yeah for sure i mean that you know it, it's um for any of us um musicians down here it's the it's the best weekend of the year every year um ju just because we all get together um we all get to play we get to see our heroes play with our heroes all hang and, and be part of this thing together and, and it's great um I mean, the, one of the reoccurring events is the big swing night that uh, me and Denny have the Bruce Island big band, and we and um, we've done that so many times uh, to a, a hall full of people dancing, and I get to be Harry James, you know, um, yeah. and stand up front of a big band, and uh, even once wearing a white tuxedo, uh, so things like that. I mean, you know, playing the music of Harry James with a, with a big band full of your mates in a big hall, stood out front. It's yeah, I mean, that's just a magical. Thing. If I could do that every night of the week, that would be that would be the gig, you know. Um, other highlights, well, piggybacking Ronnie Scott's as well. We had um, we had Bobby Shue, great Bobby Shue trumpet player, um, who's played with everyone. Um, he came down and fronted our big band, uh, playing the music of Dizzy Gillespie for Dizzy's 100th birthday. Um, and it took me like a good year to sort of really realise that like, I'm playing, I'm playing in a big band with all my mates, playing the music of a hero, Dizzy Gillespie, 
play, but the tribute is from another hero, Bobby Shoe, at Ronnie Scott's. I was like, what's going on here? And that's like, that's like bucket list stuff, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so for, we did a, uh, did a couple of nights at Ronnie's with that and then at the jazz festival as well. Um, another highlight that we took to Ronnie's was P.B. Ellis and Fred Wesley um, with the same big band. Um, we did a Louis tribute one year. I mean, just amazing things. We had Gershwin concert with a 200 strong choir um, where I played the blues from America and Paris with 200 voices behind just like leaning back and they were holding you up. Just magical stuff, you know. It was um, magical. And yeah, there, I don't think there was a dry eye, uh, eye in the audience that for that concert and that song oh. in particular. <laughs> well, it was just so powerful, man. I mean, like, you know, when you're, when you're a loud trumpet player, so often if, you, if you're going full pelt, you, you kind of eclipse the sound of the band to, in your ears and sometimes to the audience. But I just remember like playing that melody and these voices coming in behind and it was like I could lean back against them, holding me up. And, and that was just like a really, it was a quite a spiritual moment really. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so many amazing concerts there, you know. Um, we, one, of the, one of the favorite concerts was with you actually, was the album launch for the Moscow Drug Club album. Uh, at St George's, was that a year before last, wasn't it? I suppose. Uh, Two years ago. Uh, yes. Two years ago, in March. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's um, yeah, so many, so many highlights, and and just beautiful to have all of your. I mean, all of your musician friends in the same place all weekend. It's just so beautiful. It's incredible. Know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I don't think we could say enough about it. Um, the other, the other. Um, I remember talking to you, I'm sure, on on one of many, many uh, sort of car rides on touring with Moscow Drug Club, but um, Arturo Sandoval, um, I remember you just being blown away and and having that opportunity to meet him and talk yeah, to him. Got, so uh, that's, I mean, when I was, um, when I was sort of coming up, uh, Arturo Sandoval was, you know, I was hearing this guy do things that I, the trumpet had never done and probably will never do again. Um, so a picture of him up there, actually. Oh, my yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That's my little brother drew me these years ago. I've got winter <laughs> masala up here. Hey. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so Arturo Sandoval was, uh, you know, for most young trumpet players, he's a big inspiration. I mean, just a ridiculous, uh, ferocious uh, way. And... Uh, madness. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, he, I think it was the first, was it the first jazz festival, I think? Arturo came with his band, really, really hot band, um, doing his Latin jazz thing. Um, and to see that in the, in the flesh, you know, I was in my 20s then. That's mad, that's, isn't it? That's but yeah, it's just like, <laughs> wow, you know, mind blowing. And, and he's, I'm, you know, I'm a, a mile and a half from my front door, and there's my childhood hero standing there, like, playing like in Tunisia you know yeah yeah thank, thank you British Jazz and Blues Festival you know yeah it's it's just something yeah. and and I'm only I'm not sort of trying to big up the festival you know particularly it should be. It, but it's it's because I I experienced you experiencing these incredible moments um it, yeah. it's worthy of of note you know and talking well, about- I've, got, I've got goosebumps literally I've got goosebumps now thinking about um some of those sort of moments when, when we've hung out after in the bar after a gig, you know, and we've come out of having seen something amazing and been like, whoa. Yeah. And that happened yeah. again and again and again for like three or four days a, a yeah. year. Pretty yeah. So and it's, it's hard to explain almost unless you were there. And I know that lots of people who will be watching this will know exactly what we're talking about because there is a magic yeah. that's created and it's, um yeah, it's hard to put into words, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, other things as well, like playing opportunities, uh, the jam sessions, um, you know, having younger people come up, listening to some of the, the university bands just sounding amazing. Um, Bristol Horn Stars are just mad. That's and the other one's the, um, the Bristol Community Big Band, which I run, um, which we founded about eight years ago now. And they played at the Jazz Festival in the foyer a few times. I think the biggest one we had was, I think there's 46 of them. Mm. Uh, all on stage, and, and that's, that's kind of my educational baby, that band. It's been really sad this year not being able to get together with with the pandemic. Um, but that, you know, playing with that band uh, and the excitement that they get as community big band players coming to play at this 
Absolutely. And also to see you wearing another hat is really interesting, you know, because um, I did watch that last concert, which was at yeah. the last festival. Um, and to see you in your element conducting and 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 passionately being involved as as a leader um, is great yeah. for me to see because we're in it. We're in an ensemble together that's very much um, a, a group effort, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and or I have watched you being a soloist or, you know, but um, to be a conductor is a great thing. So I'm sure that the community big band are all missing you a lot. They are, you know, and I'm missing them as well. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's one of the most important things I do um, or have, have ever done really. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we started with, we put adverts out saying Bristol community big band. If you want to join a band, come along on Wednesday. And I think yeah. we started with, three people at the first rehearsal, which was something like, like a didgeridoo, a tambourine, and a swap. <laughs> I don't know. But it wasn't yeah. a big band. Then. And I thought, oh, no, this isn't going to work. Um, and then, yeah, the most we've had, I think, was 46 players. Um, and watching people, you know, they, people have made lifelong friends in that band. People have met and got married through that band. Absolutely. Um, and for yeah. a lot of people, they come back players or they, um, they're trying to, you know, have some light relief after a long week at work or, you know, night off from the kids or whatever it is. And for various different reasons, it's a really important thing for everyone. And, and um, you know, I kind of expect a lot from the main rehearsals. Uh, it's not a band that we just kind of run a chart and say, that'll do. I yeah, kind of yeah. pack the whip. Like. And they love it, you know, because I treat them like professional musicians and they sound yeah. amazing, you know, the, the, the sum of um, all the players together, you put the weaker with the stronger um, and rehearse every week. Um, you know, we normally gig normally uh five or six times a year you know they sound amazing you know yeah and i and i certainly empathize because as you know i've run um the choir. yeah uh, yeah you know the well-being choirs and for the same reason and how to a very similar experience at the beginning where it was um, it was early days and maybe six people show up and yeah. it's a bit awkward and you're not sure if it's going to fly and then yeah, yeah. cut to so weird, isn't it? years later and there's like 80 strong and and uh, I'm missing that greatly as well it's it's um it's 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 important to be involved on that level and yeah. in the community yeah i think you know for these guys as well it's it's for a lot of them i think it's kind of a, a massive part of their uh social life and a part of their management of their mental health and well-being so yeah. um you know i think it's a good it's a, probably a greater loss for certain members of those things than it is for us i mean we've obviously lost everything um but that's maybe easier in a way because for those guys, that that community thing, of course, community big band was yours. It was called a well-being choir, wasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, you know? yeah, that's, yeah, that's what it is. So, um, I really hope that that we, we can, can get, get back to it. <laughs> we will. Yeah, I mean, I've been going to be honest. Sometimes my phone goes off with the gig I should have had. Yeah, and it's like, oh, thank God, I haven't got to drive to Leeds and back today. You know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, every time, yeah. every time it's Wednesday night, I'm like, oh, I wish I was at the community big band. So. Um, we, if we any have of parallel guys, lives yeah. because mine was Wednesday night as well. We're basically the same human being. Yeah, that's okay. That works for me, Catch. I haven't got a Christmas tree though. We, we yeah. check ours down. Yeah, you know it's the got, 14th, right? <laughs> you've got guitars and pictures of trumpet players, you know. I've got actual trumpets and uh, trumpets. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you get a theme here. There's definitely a theme. Uh-huh. So I'm going to, um, can I ask you something personal? Can we talk about like, you know. Yeah. Go, hit me. Hit me. Um, so most people will not know that you suffer from spondylitis. Um, are you, can you, can you talk about that? Do you want to talk about that? I can talk about that, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of we should talk about things. Uh, so, I know. of course, um, I try and lead by example on that thing. I, I talk very openly about anything going on with me uh, in the hope that that, by example, makes other people feel it's all right to do so. Um, I've got ankylosing spondylitis, which is a form of, um, it's a rheumatic disease, 
it's similar to rheumatoid arthritis so inflammation and, and pain um targeted at joints except with rheumatoid arthritis the joints kind of crumble away over years uh with mine my immune system thinks i've broken everything so it's growing new bone so i'm experiencing sort of natural spinal fusion if you like uh so i've been in chronic pain for like 15 16 years uh which being a traveling musician is a huge effort so i live by the motto of the greater the resilience the greater the reward uh so when i finish my weekend of gigs um and drinking or whatever else anyone else is doing uh when i get to self medicating <laughs> yeah, self medicating when i wake up on a monday morning um i don't think well that was way more effort than anyone else had to put up with i think well i achieved the same as everyone else despite that so i'm fine um but i'm on a new treatment for that um which is a very expensive um immunosuppressant treatment which isn't a great thing to be starting during a pandemic uh but yeah it seems to be working i feel good it's been nice not to be in the car all day every day for a year yeah. um so uh that's been one bonus of the situation um, yeah yeah it's been an interesting thing you know and i've had lots of side effects from as you know uh from different medications and stuff along the way um and yeah it's it's um it's an anyone that's in chronic pain will know that, that it's a it's an undercurrent underneath everything you do um, and you get good days and bad days um you kind of get used to it over yeah like over 15 years so sometimes someone will ask how my back is and then it will start hurting um but you know actually and i can tell whether i'm enjoying a gig or not because if i'm not enjoying a gig my back hurts my trumpet feels really heavy uh and if i'm enjoying a gig and i'm in the zone then i feel no pain at all i completely transcend it um I can tell when you're enjoying a gig. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, it's, it's normally how many you're not enjoying a gig. But. Yeah, so um it, it's an interesting thing to have to live with. Um, you know, there's dark days. Um, you have to find a good way of thinking about it, uh, your approach to it. You have to be proactive with your exercise and I see a chiropractor and an acupuncturist and um sort of take care of yourself in that way. Um and yeah, and also learn to say no to, I'm not helping you carry the PA in. Um, it's not, it's not ideal. Uh, it's an invisible disease. If you're depping on a band sometimes, um, and there's a sort of expectation that everyone chips in with carrying this huge rig in, you know, some people you say, oh, I can't do it. I've got, I just say arthritis because no one knows what ankylosing spondylitis is. Mm. Um, but you know, sometimes you can tell people they believe you, you know, but that's their problem. Um, and you know, you do what you want, then you use it as an excuse. I've never used it as a, I've never canceled anything for that. Um, no, but yeah, learning to say no is, is important. Um, and you know, I don't think, I don't totally buy into this thing that no great art came out of, there has to be adversity to create art. Yeah. Um, I don't pity myself. Um, but I do think that the the way I play the trumpet is probably reflecting of my inner sense of being trapped and claustrophobic from my pain. That's why when I play the trumpet, I play the trumpet. Uh, so I do think that it does it does affect your voice. Um, but you know, it's not viewing it as a struggle. It's just part of me, and it, it's hard to imagine what it was like not hurting. I don't remember it not hurting. So yeah um for me it's kind of just normal now yeah well thank you for sharing that my as you know my brother suffers from the same chronic disease and yeah right it was so good to meet him and talk to him about it and um, you know anyone watching that it is dealing with anything like that that hasn't quite got their head head around how to approach that speaking to someone who's a bit older or has dealt with it for longer who actually actually understands what you're going through it is of huge help because chatting to your brother was yeah fantastic you know mm. yeah. um hasn't he, he's carrying on with his life fine isn't he he's fine gavin you know he's yeah, doing yeah, good yeah 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 he's he's got a curve in his back but he's he's uh he's all right you um, both. yeah yeah just got to keep keep using it keep on moving baby <laughs> eat smoothies yeah yeah keep smoothies. About smoothies and you know you know all the good stuff yes mm -hmm. now um, right. 
Can I um, can I ask you about uh, teaching? Because you're still able through lockdown and all this time, you're still able to teach. Is that right? Are you doing it on I Zoom am. and stuff? On Zoom, yeah. Uh, I'm doing a little bit. I didn't have a huge amount of students before we went into this. Um, I was, you know, I, I make pretty much all my living from playing. Um, therefore, only teach. I've only really been teaching that around that and i've been because i've been so busy with gigs um so i've been trying to recruit some more students through lockdown it's been nice to nice actually seeing some players develop um one student just got a merit in his grade five exam uh which is great um so yeah because it's been good to teach it's also really good for me to have some kind of structure yeah. um there's nothing else going on something to be i've got to be on the screen at a certain time you know absolutely um, yeah yeah i mean that's good as well um it's also kicked me up the butt a bit in terms of telling people to go and practice and i realize i'm not practicing myself um because of gigs or whatever mm -hmm. sometimes the lesson means that i get my trumpet in my hand and then the lesson ends and i'm like oh i'll actually do some practice now um because it is really hard it's actually quite hard with you know i've got housemates that work from home neighbors are in we're in lockdown so i can't I'm going to do it for a second now. I mean, you can't. <laughs> I want to do that. I normally do that three hours a day in public. Um, so it's quite frustrating not being able to do that. It would be a knock on the wall. I think, oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, I think I think you've just taken up all the bandwidth because <laughs> the volume of your voice has just dropped way down. Oh, if I come back now. Yeah, you have to be like, You'll have to be really close, Sean. That's all right. Is it, it might have turned the microphone down, you know? Yeah. It, it probably went, woo! <laughs> I think it did. How's that? Is that better? That's so I'm much back. better, mate. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You know, I, that, that's the problem is I can't, I normally do that three hours a day in public. And I'm the kind of player that uh, if I'm not working, I'll go and find a jam session. And that's a beautiful thing about Bristol is you can find somewhere to play. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've been practicing with a mute in, which isn't the same. Um, and then short bursts as well. You know, I think two, 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 two 45 minute sets right now would be very painful. In, um, for for all, all involved, probably. For <laughs> everyone, yeah. All enjoyful all at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah, so that, so, so teaching is good and it's, it's, um, it's obviously needs some work as well. Um, but, you know, it's, there's some students are really developing and the interface over zoom for trumpet isn't actually isn't so bad you know uh it's obviously always better to teach in the room yeah um and be able to really have a look and, and hear things better but um yeah i imagine but it's as quite, you say i mean i'm finding the same that structure of having to do something at particular times yeah. in a day and then and then you're doing it and like you say if you've got your trumpet in your hand then you're then you're ready to go and yeah, it's exactly yeah because yeah. it's, it, otherwise it's um very very difficult i think for most of us to get motivated because we don't have a gig to to you know to work towards work. yeah so i think well yeah i mean otherwise it's um it's full unemployment then really as well and it's you know you don't um you don't get to the point of making a living as a freelance musician if you haven't worked really, really hard all the time <laughs> and taken on loads of stuff to get to the point um, of yeah. being able to choose what you do. So I've worked flat out from the moment I picked it up, from practicing, studying rehearsals, and then gigs, 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 recording, teaching. So to suddenly lose all of that um, and that sense of purpose and that, you know, sourcing your own income and all that kind of stuff is you know it's quite um it's quite a shock to the system and i'm, I'm really pleased that it's not my fault <laughs> <laughs> you know. yes it's it's not john um speaking of speaking of touring and working and gigging yeah. um are you uh are you looking forward to the day that we get to spend yes. spend hours in a car driving oh. God knows where to do some crazy gig for some amazing people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't wait. I, I, I miss, I miss the Ginsters at the services. I miss the flat tires. Yeah. I miss, I miss the cheese and cress sandwiches. Four between five, you know. The, I miss the, it. Now. The ever, the the very very uh, important pre pint at the local <sighs> pub. 
No, I can't wait. I missed the whole. I even I missed the I missed the the um, even the bits that I complained about before. You know, I think we you got to take stock in these moments and think. Well, what have I taken for granted? It, yeah. Um, what have I complained about? Because I really shouldn't have been complaining, have I? You know, the sandwiches. <laughs> the sandwiches were a bit whatever. Um, yeah. It's. I'd have it all back. Even the worst gig ever. I'll play Mustang Sally for you right now. Yeah, <laughs> bring in it on. Edinburgh for you know for two hundred quid and and a um, pork pie. But yeah, I think you know I th- part of um, part of having the time away is obviously the excitement to get back to it. Um, and it's been a bit to and fro. There's been gigs booked in, and we've gone to lockdown, and it's been cancelled again, um, which is obviously quite heartbreaking. Uh, I think I lost, you know, I lost 180 gigs or something. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> and, um, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So I kind of don't get my hopes up when a gig comes in now. And um, this idea of, you know, oh, you're looking forward to the next gig bag? Yes, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to be getting my hopes up about when that is. I'll, I'll have to be on stage doing it to believe it. Yeah. So um, just just before we leave that little section. Um, yeah. Favorite favorite Moscow Drug Club gig? Or um, favorite, um, Purbeck Folk Festival. Okay. Is that what it was called? Purbeck Folk. It was a Purbeck Folk Festival. I think so. Do you remember that? It was where we got those nice photos of us on that big stage. Mm. Mm-hmm. And they were going nuts. Yeah. Yeah. I think I like that one. Um, this and George's was great, and the food they fed us really well, and yeah, all of that cider, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I think um, I think oh, the Edinburgh Jazz Festival was great as well. In the Spiegel tent, that was a nice couple of days. Um, okay, and uh, and what are you listening to at the moment? What's um, what's um, your 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 ears what am i listening to i've been really into this lafayette afro rock band uh which is a band from the 70s um an american group they all moved to, to france together um it's amazing there's an, an album it's called lafayette afro rock band and the, the album i'm obsessed with is called malik m-a-l-i-k mm-hmm. uh, which i yeah we'll put a link on the end you have to check it out it's it's like um yeah, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Great. It's it's kind of Afrobeat, funk, rock, jazz hybrid, very seventies. You'd love it. Right. Uh, love. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. It's the seventies. Seventies. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you so so much for being with me and the podcast series today. And uh, yeah, let's hope that we can play together soon and we can see each other yeah. in the same room and that you can, yeah. you know, enjoy the fruits of your labor. Is- Thank you, Gadji. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be having this conversation in a car on the way to a gig next time. Exactly. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I hope there's been some, some helpful, insightful something in there. <laughs> oh, there is. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Bye, my darling. Johnny Bruce, lots of love. Lots of love. Bye-bye.